And that's bye from me for now, and I'll hand you over to Mike. Brilliant, that's great. Uh, fantastic. Thanks very much, Henry. Uh, or should I say Caroline? I'm not quite sure. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Mike Hogan. Uh, thank you very much for coming along this afternoon, this morning, this evening, uh, whatever time it happens to be in your uh, time zone at the moment. Uh, thanks very much for uh, yeah, telling the participants how to interact with the uh, with raising their hands, answering questions. I'll, I'll have a couple of questions for you uh, during today's webinar. Um, and also thanks very much for Macmillan for inviting me along to talk to you today about um, yeah, what's, what's important um, for, for people, for professionals, uh, when wanting to think about how to become more successful communicators in their jobs or in their lives. Uh, not only in training or in class, but also when they're on the move, when they're out and about. So before I get going, I'd just like to very quickly check that you can all see and hear me okay. So if you can, it would be great if you could say something like yes uh, in the chat field, or maybe you'd like to use the smiley face, or maybe you'd like to use the green tick box, which I can see some of you are doing. I don't see anything in the chat box. Uh, oh, I do, yes. There's loads of nice and OK and smileys. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Um, OK, OK. So so very briefly, um, a little bit about me. I, I live and work in Germany. And I am a business English teacher or trainer. Um, and I also write business English materials. Um, I've written a couple of course books. Uh, I do um, online activities, articles, things like that. Um, and I've been doing this in Germany now for ooh, about 12, 13 years. And I primarily teach in companies, but I have also taught in university as well. And um, I'm, I'm aware that, oh, someone has no sound. I'm just seeing. Oksana. Oksana. Um, does anyone else have that problem? Can everyone else hear me? I realize I just asked a no question and then a yes question. <laughs> I'm getting lots of yeses. OK. So it might be her uh, a problem that she's just having at her end. And I can see that Henry has, a, has addressed that. So where I was is that, yeah, I'm aware that you may have a slightly different teaching context to me. But hopefully many of the ideas that I will share with you today will be transferable to your teaching context whether you teach in companies, in, in schools, in universities, um, whether you're teaching young adults who are pre-business experience or you're teaching business people. Uh, hopefully a lot of the ideas here will be transferable. I've said, seen Olga says it's difficult to hear you, so I'll come a little closer. I'll try to speak a little louder, uh, hopefully not too hoarse today. But let's, let's move on. Um, Henry has said, that uh, yeah, that I'll be speaking for about 45 minutes, so I will do my best to kind of keep to that. But timing is my greatest nemesis. So I'll warn you in advance. Um, the title of this webinar is "Becoming More Successful Workplace Communicators While on the Move," and that says a lot, but it maybe doesn't say that much either. So what I've decided to do is to divide up this talk into a couple of different sections. The first section is thinking about What's important for people who need to communicate in a foreign language, so in this case in English, for their jobs and part of their jobs in order to be successful? And what should we be focusing on with them when we're teaching them business English? Um, so this is kind of going to be the first part of the talk. Then I'm going to link into thinking about autonomous learning and what can we do to help our learners learn more autonomously and actually want to do it and, and really do it. And then thirdly, thinking about when they're on the move, because business people are busy. Uh, most people have to commute. So there's at least a, a, a trip to and from work involved in most people's days. So how can we use this time, once we've got them thinking about learning autonomously and motivated to do that, how can we then help them do that while they're on the go, while they're on the move? So um, in, in this kind of third part of the webinar that I'm going to tie everything together. I'm going to tell you also about 
uh, the new global business class e-workbook series and how that aims to address the issues that I'll be addressing uh, in my webinar up to that point. So let's, let's move on. Um, so these are three key questions that I would like to think about with you over the next 45 minutes or so. Is First of all, what are the key functions necessary for successful international workplace communication? How can we get busy business people to spend more time learning autonomously? And how can learners focus on improving these key functional competencies and learning autonomously while they're on the move? So it's a bit of a juggling act. Uh, I'll see if I can keep all the balls in the air without dropping any um, and, and keep you with me as we go along. So let's think first of all about the key functions necessary for, for business people in their jobs. You ask most business people uh, or learners in a needs analysis, um, why do you want to learn business English? Or if you uh, look in most courses available or course books available and you flick down through the contents, you will most likely see a number of these business skills listed there. Okay, these are these are often known as the the big six of of business English training. Uh, I think it was Mark Powell who wrote in Company who first kind of discussed this area. Um, but these you know these these are very good skills when it comes to people who let's say only need to communicate via email with their business partners or only need to make phone calls and there's never another communication channel for them. There's never another option for them. So I'm not saying that, 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 uh, that these skills are not very, very useful skills, but I think that it's also important to think about what actually needs to be communicated. Okay. I can see that some people are having difficulty seeing the slides or hearing the sound. Let me try and turn my sound up a little bit. Okay, has that turned up my microphone a bit? Am I louder now? Yes, louder. Okay. Okay. If I'm too loud, let me know. I'll move back a bit. Um, <clears throat> but wh where I'm going at with this is rather than, rather than, let's say, starting a lesson by saying, okay, everyone, today we're going to do telephoning. And next week we're going to do emailing, and in three weeks we're going to do um, some activities and some lessons on small talk. Rather than dividing what we do with our learners into into these little boxes of skills, I think a much better starting point is to think about what actually needs to be communicated. So, um, for example, the first one here: I've got a problem to solve for a customer. So of the list that I had on the last slide, which channel, which media would be best to use if I had got a problem to solve for a customer? I'll flick back and give you a look at them. Maybe you can write your ideas in the chat box for me. I have a problem to solve for a customer. I can email the customer. I might need to negotiate with them. It might be a really big problem. I can have a meeting with them. I can, I can have a phone call with them and then email them. Email or phone, negotiating, meeting. Okay, so, so this is a good example. <clears throat> is that there is no clear answer. It depends on the context. It depends on how big the problem is. It depends on the customer. It depends on where the customer is located. Is it going to be easy to meet them or not? Is it a short problem that can be just solved via the phone or via email? Or is it a larger problem that we need to meet each other about? And in very good. Sharia in India has just said what I was about to say is it could be a combination of all. You imagine the customer's got a problem. How are you going to find out about it? Probably via email. Maybe a phone call if the customer, if it's a big problem for the customer. But there'll be initial contact where you find out there is a problem. Then you have to take time, or the learner, to think about how to react and then react. That reaction action might come via phone or email, or it might automatically be um, a suggestion to set up a meeting. But that suggestion could come via phone 
or via email. Um, and someone just mentioned that India and China do business differently than in Europe. Exactly. So in this case, answering it via phone might be the worst possible thing to do in your culture. Sending an email might be better. Or just going straight to your client and knocking on their door and saying, I got your message this morning. How can I help you? I see you have a problem. Thinking about these other, these other uh, tasks to do, I need to convince my boss to make changes in the department. So which channel would you use to do that? Would you email your boss with your ideas? Would you try and call your boss with your ideas? Would you purposely hang around in the corridor outside their office to try and catch them for that 30 second quick pitch of your ideas? It could be a combination of all of them. And again, I think the answer is it depends. It depends on what your needs are, what your learners' needs are. The same with the last two, updating a project team. That could be done in a teleconference. It could be done in a web conference. It could be done by just emailing everyone around an attachment. It could be done in a meeting. And again, with the supplier. So, so thinking back about these, these business skills that we had a moment ago, I think rather than starting a lesson by saying today we're going to do telephony or today we're going to look at meetings, we should more think about the, the communicative events that our learners actually have in their jobs and how we can best prepare them for those, not with one particular channel or media. So more to think about the key functions, presenting data. That, as I mentioned, that could be done on a teleconference a web conference, face-to-face, -face. it could be an attachment in an email, and so on. Um, and, and these are just some of the key functions that business people need today to be successful. You know, it's not about compartmentalizing things into emailing and telephoning, but more looking deeper. So if my learners say to me in a needs analysis, I want to do, pre I want to do presentations or I want to do emailing, I always ask them, well, why? What sort of things do you communicate when you email? Uh, is emailing the best channel for that communication? Have you ever thought about communicating in a different way? Um, and really trying to get down to the base of why our learners communicate, what their communication goals are, and how we can then help them to achieve those goals and become more successful with their communication. So this is, um, yeah, this is kind of the first idea that I wanted to to look at with you is, first of all, rather than focusing on the, the you know, the so-called big six skills, um, I think it's a good idea to focus on how people need to function in their jobs. Um, I've heard this, this thread recently uh, at IATAFL and also at some other um, conferences or, or workshops here in Germany as well. And so it, it, it seems to be a direction or a way that the industry is going in. How can we add value to what we do for our learners? Um, so that's kind of the first key question that I wanted to look at with you. The next one is how can we get busy business people to spend more time learning autonomously? So whether the people we teach uh, are in companies or whether they're in universities or business school or maybe they're in night classes, um, if we're teaching adults, chances are they're busy and time is tight. Uh, think about it yourself as well. You know, most of us are constantly juggling uh, different tasks, um, private life, business life, hobbies, families, and everything every day. And so people might have the very best intentions of, of learning from one lesson to the next, but do they really do it? So in my context, um, I, I, well, I either do seminar training, which is intensive blocks of one, two, three days, or I do what's known as extensive training, where the learners come to um, training maybe every week or twice a week for an hour or two. Um, maybe in universities it's similar, where you see your group maybe twice a week. So how can you get some learning in between these, these blocks of training is what I'd like to think about. And um, a couple of ideas that I have found uh, 
useful in my context. Maybe they will be for you in yours, or maybe you can um, you can adapt them a little bit. But one thing that I find useful is the language that we use. If we're teaching business people, they um, yeah they're used to conversing with each other and their business partners in their professional sphere using business language, business vocabulary. And uh, they, they meet their suppliers, they meet their customers, they have meetings every week. These are meetings that they, um, they respect their business partner's time by clearing space in their schedule to go to those meetings and by preparing adequately for their meetings with their business partners. So sometimes, uh, at least in Germany, there is the problem that um, that maybe the learners don't set their their language lessons or training with such a high priority as they would their business meetings with their business partners. So the challenge is how can we get them to start thinking about us more like business partners and less like like teachers. And so something that I found useful is, uh, for example, to not use the word homework in training. So uh, at, the end, at the end of a session, I would say, here are some tasks that I would like you to complete for next week. My, my logic behind this, just, just mine, you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't work for you, um, is that if we use the word homework, people remember school. They, remember, they associate the experiences that they had of learning a language in school, and they think about homework as we had in school. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't always do my homework in school. Um, but if I'm going to a business meeting, and at the end of a meeting, there are tasks distributed to complete before the next meeting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really make an effort and make sure I get those tasks done. So just using, using language in a slightly different way with our learners can help them see us more like, uh, like business partners. So you've heard me mention the word training a couple of times as well. Um, Generally, this is synonymous with teaching, um, but when we are helping business people to improve their performance, their, their communicative performance, then effectively we are training them to become better at what they do. And so in, in business English, at least in companies, training tends to be the word that is used as synonymous with teaching, which might have been in, in a, more of a school environment. So depending on your environment, you could choose to alter the language that you use. And I'm not speaking about training in the sense of teacher training. We're speaking about learner training here at the moment. You know? Again, I, I like to use the word learners or even participants, course participants, rather than students. If you're in a business context, if you're in a business setting. Of course, if you're in a university setting, then yes, you do have students. But again, calling people learners takes them mentally out of the box uh, of, of where they might have been if they were thinking about school. So, so this is just you know a couple of ideas in terms of um, the language that you use. Another one is at the at the beginning of every uh, training session, um, just like at the beginning of, of lessons in school, uh, the teacher would or should give an overview of what's going to be covered today. <coughs> another another language usage. Uh, idea or tool is rather than use the word overview, why not use the word agenda? Because our, 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 our learners, they go to business meetings all the time and they have agendas for their business meetings. So using more business sounding like language will get our learners more in tune with seeing us like business partners. That in itself will psychologically, hopefully, get them more in tune with preparing for the training sessions more. Hence, we can get them learning autonomously a bit more in between training sessions. Um, another idea is uh, schedule management or communication. Um, my, my learners uh, who, who work in companies, or even the ones who don't, students, universities, people generally tend to have a calendar these days, an electronic calendar to help organize themselves. It might be in their phone. It might be in their computers. It might be Outlook, something like that. And so I send my learners Outlook meeting invitations for the training sessions. So when they accept them, it gets logged into their schedule, into their work schedules. So then there's a higher chance that when someone else calls them and says, hi, can we have a meeting at 3 o'clock on Wednesday, they look at their schedule and they see that they've already blocked it off for me and they've already accepted my invitation. 
So again, this is just trying to boost um, boost attendance and and boost the the way that they view the time that they invest uh, to to do their learning. You know, um, and you know, in, in in terms of communication with our learners, just talking the talk, talking more like a business partner can can really help our learners see us in a different way. Um, focusing with them on their return on investment as well. Um, someone mentioned, this is, does this only work with Outlook, um, Valeria? Uh, no, you can also send meeting invitations, um, for example, via uh, Google calendars. If you have a Gmail account, there's a calendar function in there. Uh, I think if you have a Microsoft formerly Hot, Hotmail account, uh, that's now linked directly with Outlook. But generally, if, if you have a computer, there's probably an email uh, calendar function in there. And even if you're working with a different calendar function to your learners, you'll still be able to invite them and accept invitations. But thinking about return on investment with our learners, um, again, businesses revolve around getting returns on their investment. You spend something, you invest something, and you want to get something back for it. Our learners might not, not, might not necessarily be paying for the training. Uh, their company might be paying for it. So we need to get them thinking about, well, what are they investing in order to come? They're investing their time. They're investing maybe two or four or six hours every week for a long period of time. So we need to think, we need to talk to them openly and get them thinking about, well, what do you want to get back for that investment? What do you think you should get back? What are your goals for learning? Where's A, where you are now, and B, where you want to get to? And is, is it just enough to attend every week and do nothing in between that? Will you be able to make this, this step by the end of the course? Or will you be happy if you only make it this far? If, will a bit of autonomous learning and extra task work at home get you up this far? You know, these are all things to talk about with your learners in the beginning to really get them thinking about the return they want from the time that they are investing. And that's not counting if they're investing money. If they're paying for the course themselves, then of course they're investing money as well. Um, so these are all, these are all things that I find kind of all tie into the bigger picture of getting our learners to think more about working for their learning uh, in addition to just attending. So this indirectly links in with the whole concept and idea of autonomous learning. Is that it, first of all, before we come up with ideas as to how they can learn autonomously, we need to get them open to learning autonomously. And not only open to it, but wanting it and coming and asking us for it and saying, what can I do? Um, so this is, yeah, this is something that I do with my training. Some of my colleagues and, and peers here in Germany do the same, and uh, generally tends to work in our context. So it, it, it might be useful in yours, or you can adapt some of these ideas to, to fit your context. So this I've kind of started to link into now as well, is to trying to, trying to foster a training philosophy in our training with our learners around self-responsibility, that, that, that we are not responsible for their learning achievement. We can help them, uh, we can really do our best, but at the end of the day, they also need to take responsibility for their learning, uh, and that involves doing something in between training sessions. So whatever they're doing in between training sessions, if you think about the, the kind of the course book, workbook context, if they're working in a workbook, um, you know, a pen and paper workbook, they've got to wait until they come back to the training the next week to get the answers, uh, which, which is not that motivational. I mean, if you think, think to yourself, if you have a smartphone or an iPad or something like that, and you, or even, even, even how we get information these days, searching for Google, we want, we want immediate success. Um, we want to know the answers now when we search for something online. Or think about playing computer games. If you play games on your phone or on your iPad or something like that, how computer games are structured has also changed in the last 10 years. Instead of having longer levels with more work that needs to be done before success can be reached, there are a lot of games like uh, things like Angry Birds and things like that where the levels are very, very short because you can get success faster. It's measurable against what you did a few moments ago. And this gives you the little motivational and psychological boost to keep going and keep trying. 
So whatever we're helping our learners with learn autonomously, we need to have something which will give them immediate success, not having to wait to come to training the next time, um, and something which is measurable. And, and I've written in the other two points here, of course, media rich, because, you know, these days, um, with so many sources of media bombarding us constantly from the internet and YouTube and videos and our phones and everything else, black and white paper workbooks don't really seem to cut it anymore, you know? And of course, relevance is the key as well. Think about the time you spend on, on a hobby or an interest every week. Think about the ones that you wish you could do more of, but you don't. And that's because they are less relevant for you. We prioritize our time doing things that are relevant for us, and we don't do things that are not relevant for us. And so if the learning for our learners that we're encouraging them to do autonomously is relevant for them, then they are more likely to do it than if it's not. So this is kind of this, uh, this second point is just to summarize quickly on point two, how can we get busy business people to spend more time learning autonomously? Is the first the first point was to get them thinking more about us like business partners in a business relationship so that they as professionals will better prepare for the face-to-face -face sessions that they have with us on one hand, and then on the other hand, getting them thinking about the return they want on their own investment, the time and effort that they're putting into their training. Um, you know, just coming to the to the face to face sessions is not going to be enough. They need to want, you know, they're going to need to do something in between. Um, and so then, if we can get them to that step where they're coming to us already asking us, what can I do before the next session? And this is great. So now we need to think about how can we get them focusing on improving these business competencies that we spoke about earlier. You know, in addition to the telephoning and the emailing, more the functions of, you know, persuading someone or expressing doubts or being uncertain about something or solving a problem or things like that. How, how can we get them to focus on these? And also to think about it while they're on the move because, because business people, um, yeah, they are on the move a lot, whether they're on business trips or whether they're just commuting to the office. Society these days tends to involve a lot of movement. Um, and, and, yeah, I think that this time is time that can also be used doing something else simultaneously. So moving on uh, is to thinking about how to get our learners learning on the move. Uh, I'm going to ask you a quick question, quick poll question. So I'd like you to use the, the little tick box that should be, be beneath your name or beside your name. And um, tick the box, please, if you have either a smartphone, an MP3 player, or a tablet of some kind, like, a, like an iPad or something like that. So if you have, if you have a smartphone, an MP3 player, um, or, or a tablet. Okay, so we're getting, I can see the ticks rising up. Some people are saying no, some are saying yes. I do know, though, that everyone has a computer because you're on one now <laughs> watching me. Okay, so that number, that number is climbing high. We're at over 80 so far. So basically what I want to say is that um, society, global society, is changing. I know some of you might be in different countries or in different continents, rather, and I know that things are moving and changing at different paces and different speeds, and some have more technology and some have less technology, but generally things are moving forward um, with technology, with the speed of which we can communicate with each other, but also with the gadgets and the technology that we can bring around with us. Um, but we also need to, yeah, we need, we need to think about where to start when recommending uh, things for our learners to learn autonomously. and. Um, I guess just like, just like these cakes here, there's just so many different nice ones to choose from. Where do we start? With this, I'm, I mean that if you just look at the Internet, there are so many different sources of learning out there. There's so many different places where you can do activities. 
and where you can uh, watch videos and interact with others, and the choice can be very, very overwhelming. Um, and we need to get our learners thinking, or we for our learners need to think about all of these different points that we have listed here around the side. And so a good starting point is where you do have control over their learning. And that is in your training room, in your classroom. So if, for example, you are already working with a course book. So uh, the example here I'm going to give is, is the Macmillan Global course book. So imagine you're already working with this course book in your training. And, and you could give your learners opportunities to learn autonomously, <coughs> which are linked thematically and linguistically with what you're doing in your training, but also extremely flexible so that your learners can, can learn what is relevant for them and pick and choose what they want and learn on the move and things like that. And so this is what, um, what Macmillan have done with uh, the e-workbook, the Global Business Class e-workbooks, uh, which I was involved in in writing the business content for. Um, and what it has done is that it has built on the, uh, the award-winning e-workbooks that came with the, um, originally came with the Global Coursebook series. And it's built on those to uh, in include business content, so which can either be used in connection with a course book that you're using in class as an e-workbook, or it can be used as a standalone solo operator. So if you're not working with the global course book series, but you're working with a different series, or you're not working with any course books whatsoever, um, here, I, I've got one here. It comes as a standalone booklet with CDs in the back, basically. And uh, the learners can then learn autonomously uh, using the functions, using the CD, using the activities on the CD. So I'm going to just spend, keeping an eye on the time, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes now giving you a very quick overview uh, of how it's structured and how it, uh, it addresses the points that I've been addressing already in today's webinar. So basically, the first thing is is that it offers the opportunity to uh, to learn any place and any time for the learners because uh, they can put the CD into a computer and work straight from the computer. So everyone who is here watching this session right now can do that because you're on a computer watching me. And um, if you don't have a computer or if you uh, know that you're going to be offline, or if your learners know that they're going to be offline for a period of time, for example, they're taking a train journey, they're taking a flight, they want to go to the beach for a few hours and don't bring the computer with them, they can print off uh, the files, the reading files, the, uh, the writing files from the e-workbooks uh, in, in, in PDF format and take them with them in paper and work on them that way or they can put them onto a mobile device, like a tablet, a smartphone, MP3 players. There's the audio files, the video files, things like that. They're all, they're all available. So very briefly, how does it look? Uh, when you put the, the, uh, the disk in, when you load it up onto your computer, the interface looks, uh, looks like this, in which there is the business class specific activities, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, there's the printing work, which I mentioned a moment ago as well, if you're going to be offline. There's all of the listening and the video files. There are built-in word lists and dictionaries. There's the grammar help tool. There's writing tips. There's loads and loads of stuff in there. Uh, so luckily, there's a content map as well, so you can get an overview of everything that is in there. Uh, I'm just going to show you a couple, of, a couple of the highlights, which I think are pretty cool. Um, first of all, when you put it in, when you're looking at the business class material, uh, you can see it's divided into vocabulary sections, uh, business listening, business reading, business writing, business videos, and the work globally sections. I came to the work globally sections last because I just wanted to kind of highlight that they are mirrored or matched with the business functions that I was speaking about earlier on. So rather than focusing on specifically on things like telephoning, emailing, meetings, they're more focusing on on functional competencies, which can be used using different media. Um, is there an elementary level for this book? 
There, I think there is. I know definitely for global business class, for the e-workbooks, it starts from pre-intermediate level. Uh, so it's pre-intermediate, intermediate, over-intermediate, and advanced books. Uh, global itself is not a business book. It is a book for adults. Um, and what the global business class e-workbooks have done is that they've added business content to the course book. The course book looks like this. And it is, it's a, it's a general English for adults course book. And then the workbook, the business class workbook is the add-on. Uh, so that if your adult learners want to have business content, they can as well. Or if your business people want to work with a book which isn't purely business, but they want to have the e-workbook which is business, then you've got lots of opportunities for, um, for flexibility. Um, Someone has written, Barbara's written, that critical approach thinking is, is interesting in this book. The, the whole series, whether it's the, the, the course book or the e-workbook, the business class e-workbooks, they encourage critical thinking in the context and the themes that they are discussing. So, for example, um, the business reading files here, speaking about money in business, um, the, the, the kind of... the the, the the slogan, if you wish, of the series is learn English, learn through English, and learn about English. And so uh, it's not only just about learning the language, it's about learning through the language. And so in this case, we're trying to get the learners to learn in, in, in this context about business topics and to think critically about business topics, business relationships, differences from my country to your country, you know, intercultural differences that there might be between different business partners, uh, and so on. So uh, this is a quick overview of, of how the interface looks on your computer. Um, and there's loads of different uh, activity types to choose from. Here is a very uh, quick look at one of the work and function globally sections. Here is an excerpt from a presentation. Uh, it's interactive, which means you can, you, know, you can drag and drop the words into the gaps. Uh, it focuses on the key vocabulary necessary for um, presenting information, but not specific to a presentation, because you might need to do this on the telephone as well. Um, as I said before, you get immediate feedback. You can see the answers. You can check them. You can try again. And so the learners can learn autonomously, uh, following up on something that you have done with them in their face-to-face -face training. Uh, again, with the vocabulary and grammar practice, here's something on budgets and metaphors for dealing with money. Uh, the learners get immediate feedback, as you can see on the left. They get to look at their overall scores. Um, they can build up what's called a mark book, so they can see over time how they're doing. Um, and you can map everything that they're doing, if you want to, on their own with what you're doing in face-to-face -face training. There's a huge amount of flexibility there. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, it's possible to um, to print off uh, PDF versions or files for uh, for reading and for listening. And again, uh, the the reading task here is one, for example, on humor in business. Uh, this aims also to get learners thinking critically about humor in business in their own context. So it asks, you know, it asks a lot of questions, but it also pulls up a lot of vocabulary and it gets them thinking critically. So these are things that they could then potentially bring into training as part of a discussion. So you can kind of flip your learning, so to speak, and get them to do the reading and the preparation at home so that when they come to training with you, you can have more interactive, meaningful training sessions by opening up discussions about these topics. So you've got the reading files, uh, the writing files, for example, report writing with examples of uh, the key language necessary in reports. And then uh, the, the learners get to write the report themselves. And so this then is something that they can give to you uh, to correct. Um, are the materials printable? I've seen Natalia has just written. So some of them are. Uh, the reading, the writing files are. Um, and then moving on to a mobile device. Uh, for your learners that have mobile devices, uh, then you can also put, oops, 
you can also put uh, the listening activities, the video activities, the class book audio. You can put all of these onto your uh, onto your mobile devices. Uh, it's incredibly easy to do that. I always I always wonder myself how really easy is it to, to to play with all this computer stuff and get it from here to there and on my mobile device and things like that. When I see presentations like these, you know, but. In this case, I really wanted to check how easy it really was, so I, I gave my, my, uh, my iPad to my daughter there earlier on and asked her to see if she could do it. And um, here we go. The results of her hard work. There is uh, one of the videos from the series. I can see there's a little reflection coming through, but I'll play it very briefly for you. Pleased to meet you. Hold on to that name and don't forget it. Step three. Start a conversation. Show that you are interested in the other person by asking them a question. Okay. So that was uh, a very quick excerpt from a video on networking. Um, show that you're interested in the other person by asking them a question. When the other person says their name, repeat their name. Here I have the same video clip on my phone. Okay, let's come back to come back to step one for making contact. But it's really easy to get this stuff on your devices. You basically have the disk in your computer already. You've got an option to save locally, which means saving it onto your computer from the disk. And then once it's saved locally on your computer, you can plug in your device or your learner's pen and literally drag and drop the file onto the memory of your phone or tablet or or whatever it is you have. It's very, very easy to do. So, um, yeah, so that is pretty much it, I think. Um, it's important with all of this to find the right blend as well, the right blend um, for you uh, and also for your learners, you know. Um, some learners will want to do more uh, listening and more watching of videos autonomously, so you can recommend that part of the the, the e-workbooks to them. Others might want to work more on their grammar or vocabulary. You can recommend that part. This will also save you time in your classroom or in your training room. If you have learners who need to brush up on their grammar or their vocabulary, these are so-called head-down activities. These are things that they can be doing on their own at home. So that frees up more time for you in your training sessions on heads-up activities, which is basically speaking and talking. So you can get them preparing for role plays or preparing for discussions at home using the e-workbooks and then having more interactive, meaningful sessions face-to-face. Uh, -face. So that pretty much brings me to the end of, uh, of today's session. There's a quick review uh, of the three kind of main points I wanted to look at with you is the first one, when we're thinking about what to teach our business English learners, we should be thinking about the functions they need to use, what they need to communicate, and what their, what their goal of communication is. Is it persuasion? Are they trying to influence someone? Are they trying to solve a problem? And then think of the media or, 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 yeah, or the channels, the medium, the media, um, that they will need to communicate this. Second one is, if we act and think and talk like business partners, we'll get them seeing us like business partners. We'll get them thinking more professionally about preparing for the next meeting that they have with us. Um, so getting them really thinking about their return on investment uh, to, to push this drive to want to learn autonomously. And then the third point um, is, uh, yeah, they can focus on these things while they're on the move by using something uh, which they can print off uh, and work with when they're not near their computer or something that they can put on their tablets, their smartphones, and things like that. And so that was where uh, the ideas and the examples from the Global Business Class e-workbooks uh, came into this today. Uh, I can say it was really great fun um, writing the content for it. Um, and a lot of the ideas that I've given you today, a lot of my experience from training is reflected in the content uh, in the e-workbooks. So if you'd like to find out more about them, you can have a look at the website, contact your local rep, uh, something like that. So that brings me to the end of this webinar. I'd like to say a big thanks again to all of you guys for coming along, uh, taking an hour out of your busy day, morning, evening, uh, middle of the night, wherever you happen to be. 
Uh, yeah, please keep in touch if you'd like to via uh, LinkedIn. I've got a LinkedIn profile. Um, if you do, please let me know that you were in the webinar just so I can place you and, and know who you are. Um, if you're on Twitter, uh, I tweet about business-related topics, about business English, business teaching, teaching in general, mobile learning, things like that. Um, or you can email me through my online profile um, and share some ideas with me if you like. So I think that brings me to the end. I'll pass back to, uh, to Henry, who will tell you about a couple of uh, forthcoming events with Macmillan, uh, including one where we might have a chance to see each other again in a month or so. Henry, Hi, I'm Mike. Uh, welcome. That was a brilliant session. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, thanks again for coming today. I uh, echo Mike's thoughts. And uh, please do follow him on social media. I can assure you he's a font of knowledge and he's uh, well worth adding to your Twitter feed. Um, as Mike was just saying there at the end, I do have a couple of short points to um, bring your attention to uh, about what we're up to at the moment, which uh, may be of interest. <coughs> I'm going to share a website with you briefly, um, which is about a uh, campaign of our, ours. Oh, wrong button. We're currently running a, a back-to-school campaign as it's uh, September and the beginning of a new term. Uh, that may or may not have worked. It doesn't look like it wants to work today. So uh, I'm posting the URL in the chat box and you can click to that and what you'll find is a uh, whole host of resources for the new term which we're making available for ELT teachers. Um, now as part of that, Mike's actually kindly agreed to um, run a Google Hangout for us, which we're very excited about. Um, I will include some more information about that in the email which goes out to you all uh, with the certificate. Uh, the website's decided to uh, work now, so you, can, you should be able to see it in the presentation box there. Um, yes, as I was saying, Mike is um, going to be on your screens again on Wednesday the 16th of October from 4 p.m. UK time. So put the date in your diary. I'm going to share the uh, event page with you now as well, quickly too, in the uh, chat box as well, so that you can sign up. So that's a hangout with Mike, and it's on the topic of, drum roll please, um, creating a feedback culture in ELT. Um, I'll take you to that website now too, in fact. So we'd love to see you there. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever taken part in a Hangout before, but they're great fun. Uh, a little bit like webinars, but um, just slightly more interactive. You can um, actually talk to Mike face-to-face -face, well, via a computer if you're one of the lucky ones um, <coughs> who uh, gets in the room. So there's sort of 10 of you together. And then if you don't get there in time, don't panic because you can watch the live stream from the outside and uh, put any questions to him via Twitter or... Uh, email us later. You should hopefully all be able to see that now. So you just uh, navigate to our Google Plus page for more information and to sign up, and then you'll be kept informed of the uh, link that you need to watch the um, event on the day itself. Um, one final thing we have our next webinar happening as well on the 2nd of October, and that's with Miles Craven. Uh, again, there'll be a line or two about that in the email that goes out to you uh, after today's session as well. So uh, we hope to see some of you there then. If not, then we hope you've uh, enjoyed it today. It's great to see so many of you here. Don't forget that uh, the recording is going to be available on the website and YouTube as well. Uh, so it's there for you to enjoy uh, again if you want to watch it or share it with your friends. Just follow our social media channels for more news on that. And I'll let you know as soon as it goes up live. Mike, did you want to just say a few more words quickly? Say bye to everyone. Yeah, uh, now I've uh, finished. Yeah, just thanks again to you, uh, to Henry, for, for moderating today's session, to Macmillan for inviting me along, uh, and also giving me the great opportunity to work on the, uh, the Global Business Class e workbooks. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hanging out with, uh, with some of you guys in, in a month for the Google Plus Hangouts, where I'll be speaking about uh, creating a feedback culture with your groups. Um, so that you can be sure that you are doing the very best that you can do uh, by getting feedback from them, but also how you can uh, push 
your learners a little bit by creating a culture in which you can be very open with your feedback to them uh, and really getting them to uh, to work on certain things themselves. So there'll be there'll be a short little uh, intro going on YouTube uh, very soon as well. So keep an eye out for the link to that uh, and maybe see you in a month's time. Yep. I'll be there too. So uh, the uh, double act of Mike and Henry will uh, resume business in a month's time. <laughs> I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you there. I can see actually some people have uh, registered already, so that's great. Um, okay, uh, watch this space for more information. Uh, so that brings us to the end of today's session then, as we're approaching 4 o'clock here. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye now, and uh, hopefully see you at either one of the Hangouts or uh, our next webinar in October. Uh, so it's bye from Henry, and it's bye from Mike. Um, bye from Mike. Okay, see you. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Take care.